Today I will talk about my setup for managing and editing video directly on my Synology NAS. To cut to the chase, once you have everything set up for 10 gigabit Ethernet, you can edit video perfectly well over the network on your NAS. And that's how I edit my video these days. Let's get into it with a demo. So here we can see I'm in Final Cut Pro and navigating around an existing project and it's pretty snappy. I can start clips, move around, play stuff back. And it makes sense that it's snappy because Final Cut Pro does cache everything, but all the importing and even the exporting of your finished product is pretty darn fast. So here we go to some files of me running. I used to film video of myself running on a GoPro and these are all four gigabits in size, I open one up and you can see how quick I can navigate back and forth within a file. So this is not cached. This is just live over the network. Switch to another file. And there you see, again, it's instantaneous. And now for a more concrete example of file performance, I'm going to copy a Linux distro to the NAS, and that takes just a couple seconds. That's two gigs. And here's an Oracle file that's six gigabytes, and you can see how fast that moves over. Just in a few seconds, moving at about half a gig per second. There's nothing to complain about this performance. Like many, I began creating and editing video seriously at the onset of the pandemic when we suddenly found ourselves unable to go to church in person and needed ways to produce music for our online services. I spent quite some time learning the ropes in Final Cut Pro and we made a lot of those videos you see with multiple musicians in their own little windows in the main video screen. Right away I realized that my iMac just didn't have enough disk space to keep on filling it with the gigantic video files. Sure, I could buy an external drive, but it occurred to me that I'd just recently set up a Synology NAS with a lot of space, and I started looking into whether or not I could edit video directly on the NAS. The short answer is yes, but it's painful, but there is hope. At the time, I tried using Final Cut Pro to edit video over my standard gigabit home network, and it wasn't pretty. Then I heard about the wonders of 10 gigabit Ethernet, and I began to dream. My dreams were short-lived as I saw the cost of 10 gigabit Ethernet equipment, and as I became a little perplexed at all the connectors and cables involved. I suppose that these days SPF Plus ports and cables shouldn't be surprising, but at the time they just seemed a little bit intimidating, and I realized I'd have to redo everything with those ports. Fast forward to today, and I found that not only is the 10 gigabit Ethernet equipment more accessible, but these days you don't even need to use those unusual cables. Over home network distances, CAT6 with RJ45 will be just fine. So the question is, why do this? To be frank, I spent about $800 setting everything up for 10 gigabit Ethernet in order to edit video on the Synology NAS. Why didn't I just spend $250 and purchase a 4 terabyte external drive? That would have worked amazingly well. But the high-speed network provides more. It allows me to copy large files to and from multiple machines, improve performance of my scheduled backups, and I could, if I wanted, collaborate with others on the same video project over the network. It's pretty neat. You can do all kinds of really good stuff with this kind of throughput. I like networking. Onwards. Here's the setup. In order to perform 10 gigabit video editing, I needed to buy three things. I needed to have a 10 gigabit adapter for the desktop machine. I needed to have a 10 gigabit card for the Synology NAS. And I needed a 10 gigabit switch as a go-between. And here we have the original switch for my home network. It's a 24 port switch and I happen to have power over Ethernet so it was really handy for me to use a 10 gigabit switch that was powered by power over Ethernet and the regular OG 1 gigabit Ethernet cable is coming in providing the internet and then on the Synology NAS we kept the old cable 
that's running through the wall. And likewise, on my iMac, I added a dock with 10 gigabit Ethernet, and I keep the old cable in the wall because I can use RJ45 jacks with Cat6 cable for the whole thing. The max you can use is 180 feet or 55 meters, and that's long enough for any home network I can think of. My original NAS is a Synology DS1621 Plus enclosure, so I'd have to purchase a 10 gigabit Ethernet card made by Synology. So that was, there's no question about that. When I was looking for a desktop 10 gig Ethernet adapter, I found several standalone USB C devices that provide a single Ethernet port, but they were all pretty expensive for what you get out of it, and they draw the power from the desktop machine, and you lose a port. I decided I wanted to have an external dock instead. That way, for a bit more, I could have some extra ports and the dock would be powered by its own power supply. I was not feeling so happy about having something that people were saying gets so hot being powered from the motherboard on my iMac. Finally, my home network is all Ubiquiti gear, so it would make sense for me to buy a 10 gigabit network switch made by Ubiquiti. This isn't necessary, and I could have saved money by purchasing a different switch, but I do like that the Ubiquiti gear is all managed through their central user interface, and the one that I selected, it's PoE. Here's what I settled on. Starting with the NAS adapter on the right is the Synology card. It was $140. At the top is the OWC Thunderbolt Pro Dock for $320, and at the bottom is a 10 gigabit switch from Ubiquiti for $300. As I said earlier, the easiest call was the Synology E10G18T1 10 gigabit PCI expansion card, 140. The OWC 10 port Thunderbolt 3 Pro Dock was 320 at the time I bought it. This was the most expensive part of all, but it's going to provide me additional things beyond just being a Ethernet port. I found that the single port USB 10 gig adapters were as low as $75. And for the network switch, I went with the Ubiquiti Networks Unify Switch Flex XG 4 port 10G managed network switch for $300. Surprisingly, this wasn't a crazy expensive device. Other switches with 10 gigabit RJ45 jacks cost between $250 and $300. If I'd gone with a cheaper switch, I might have saved $50, and if I stuck with basic USB-C to 10 gigabit adapter, I could have saved well over $200, bringing that sum down to about $500. Let's talk about the installation. Came in three parts. Step one, I installed and configured the Ubiquiti switch. This had to be the first step because I need to be able to plug the other devices into the new switch. The second step was installing the card in the NAS. And the third was setting up the dock, which proved to be a little bit more challenging than I expected. And it's just from my own silliness. I installed the Ubiquiti switch. It was almost trivial. I connected the port from my 24-port PoE switch that had originally gone to the desktop machine directly to the PoE port on the new switch. And then it was a matter of going into the Ubiquity network app and adopting the new switch. That's the terminology they use. It took about 10 or 15 minutes as firmware was downloaded and installed, but it was a fully automated process. The NAS card installation also went very smoothly. I simply did a graceful shutdown of the NAS and I removed all the screws from the enclosure. And there's a little filler plate that's in the back where the slot is. I took the little filler plate out. Then I installed the card, and there's a screw that held the filler plate, and I put that back. Then I plugged one end of the existing NAS cable into the new switch, and plugged the other end into the new jack on the back of the NAS, and restarted everything. No configuration needed whatsoever. I did go into the Synology disk management software and look at the settings and make sure there really was a 10 gigabit adapter there. And sure enough, it was. Success! So now I just needed to set up the Thunderbolt Pro dock. And this was more annoying than it needed to be. And for, again, for the silliest of reasons. I couldn't get the OWC logo on top of the dock to glow blue, as the documentation said it should. And it made me triple check everything. I was made sure I was using the 
Thunderbolt port on my Mac, and I made sure I it was connecting the Thunderbolt on the the dock. I even got my wife's MacBook, and that had a Thunderbolt port. I tried that, and every way I did it, I would see the logo was remained white, and that says that it's not connecting. I, I went into the properties, the system properties on the Mac, and I checked the Thunderbolt bus. I couldn't see any devices on there. I was pulling my hair out, and I figured what well, must be the cable because both the Mac and the, the uh, MacBook were having the issue. And so I went to Staples to try and get a new cable, and I found out these cables are expensive and they're unobtainium in places like Staples. And I came home totally disappointed, and then I said, maybe it's the jack. Let me try that. And I tried plugging the cable into a different port on the back of the dock, and it all just worked. The problem was that on the back of the dock, there was a single port on one end that looked tantalizingly like the port that you would be connecting to your computer. Kind of like how on the back of a router, you have this one port set aside from all the rest where you plug your internet connection in, and then you have four other ports you plug into other things. No, turns out that that was not the one port you plugged your computer. You actually had to look for the little lightning symbol that would be above one of the two little ports in the middle. Those are the ones you plug your computer. And the one on the end is just a port that you would hook up some other device, like uh, maybe I'm using it right now to charge my iPad. So it works. There's no problem with it. One thing I did find was the cables are super sensitive and you breathe on them and you lose your connection. Can't have that during file transfer. So what I did is I ended up buying this little thing, which is surprisingly expensive, and but it's called a Klingon, Klingon made by OWC. And it just screws onto the dock and it holds the cable absolutely still. And ever since I got that, haven't had any issues. Before I go, let me explain how you use this with Final Cut Pro. You have to migrate your Final Cut Pro libraries from where they exist right now, probably in the Movies folder, to the NAS. So you want to go into the application. You want to delete all the generated content, all the cache and things like that. Then drag the library from its current place to its new home. Wait till it's transferred. Wait till you and make sure you've done a backup and you're happy with the new location, you're happy everything's working, then you can eventually delete the old one. And then you want to go in when you launch it, just double click the icon for the library. It'll launch Final Cut Pro. It'll probably spend quite some time uh, trying to rebuild caches and things like that. You want to go in and redirect the cache. So you go to the library's properties and edit the, the file destinations and you will want to choose a place on your local machine where you're going to put the cache, just because it's much faster if the cache is run locally. So that way you can have tons and tons and tons of video on NAS that you edit and you manipulate, but the ones that are you're working on now are the ones you would keep cache files locally on. You could delete all the old cache files and save space. So there it is. It all works perfectly. If you want to set up like this, it's, it's worth it in my opinion. You can continue using the same Cat6 cables that you have threaded throughout your walls, and you can do all kinds of other network stuff besides just moving giant files from your machine to your NAS and doing video editing on your NAS. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you for watching.